on the afternoon of December 3rd, 2010. Best friends and roommates Nicole Glass and Melissa Mason, both 27 years old, were found dead in their Phoenix, Arizona home. When the police interviewed Melissa's loved ones, they discovered she was around eight weeks pregnant, turning this into a triple homicide according to Arizona law. Despite a thorough investigation, the police haven't identified any motives or suspects. It's been just over 13 years since Nicole, Melissa, and Melissa's unborn child were murdered, and investigators are still searching for the person responsible. Hey everyone, Happy New Year, and welcome back to Detective Perspective. My name is Derek Lavasser. I'm a licensed private investigator and former police detective, and each week I'll be covering an unsolved case in story format. I'll then give you my perspective on the investigation and provide contact information for the individuals or organizations connected to the case so that if you have any tips, you can contact them directly and maybe you can help solve a case. And if you're someone who's interested in true crime, I'm assuming you are if you're here, but more specifically unsolved cases, and you'd like to hear my opinion on those investigations, please consider subscribing whether you're watching on YouTube or listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or whatever platform you use. So before I dive into the synopsis on this week's case, I just want to say it's good to be back. As you can probably tell, I'm feeling much better than I was at the end of 2023. Uh, about 90% of the way there, I feel like I'm still uh, a little sick, still have a little bit of a cold, but I, I think right around this time of year, 90% is good enough. I feel like everyone's sick right now. So uh, it's good to be back. I'm, I'm feeling refreshed. I'm excited about the new year. I'm excited about what we have in store for Detective Perspective. Um, I'm going to be giving you something to share at the end of this episode. We're going to be teaming up with Seasons of Justice for the month of January. I'll give you the specifics at the end of the episode. So again, I just want to say, hey, if you're here, if you're listening or if you're watching, Thank you for coming back. I know I was off for a little bit there, but definitely needed the downtime to kind of recover and spend some time with the family over the holidays and prep for the new year, but I'm ready to go. So let's dive into the summary on this week's case. So Nicole Glass and Melissa Morn is who we're talking about this week. This is a little different than what I normally cover on Detective Perspective. This, this investigation has been covered a little bit, and I usually tend to stay away from cases that have gotten exposure before. Uh, but this case has been covered by the Deck Podcast, Dateline. So there is some news about it out there. But for me, just looking over the, the details of this case, it's a little over 13 years old. The way they were killed, there's just, there's got to be someone out there who knows something. Someone who may not be directly involved. If you can pinch him or get him with something over their head, I really think this one's still solvable. Obviously, it's an open investigation, so we don't know all the evidence they have. But I just want to get as much exposure as we can about this case out there. So I figured, hey, this is what we're here to do. Let's cover it. Maybe there's someone here who's listening to this or watching this who hasn't seen news on this on one of the other podcasts or on television. And who knows? You have nothing to lose, everything to gain. Maybe something here on this show resonates with someone and they decide to come forward. So with that all out of the way, let's get right into this week's case. Nicole Rose Glass, born on April 1st, 1983, shared a special bond with her mom, Rachel, who described her daughter as positive, upbeat, nurturing, loving, and determined. Nicole always stood by her friends and family, offering support no matter the situation. According to Rachel, Nicole had a playful side and enjoyed making people laugh with pranks. She also loved animals, especially horses and dogs. Nicole's friendly nature made her perfect for customer service, and in 2004, she began working as a bartender at the Pantera Show Club, a strip club in Phoenix, Arizona. It was there she met Melissa Mason, another bartender at the time. Nicole and Melissa became best friends and roommates, sharing a home on a cul-de-sac in the 4200 block of East Cambridge Avenue. Eventually, Nicole and Melissa left the Pantera Show Club and started working at the Sweet Spot, another strip club in Phoenix. While it's unclear if Nicole continued working there into the winter of 2010, we do know that she was still living with Melissa at the time. 
Additionally, Nicole was working on a degree in communications with the goal of getting a job in public relations. Now, Melissa Renee Mason, born on April 14, 1983, grew up in a close-knit family in Tucson, Arizona. Her mom, Sandra, described Melissa as the best daughter a mom could have. She had a big heart and had a comforting presence, making people feel at ease just by being around. Melissa's younger sister, Samantha, remembers her as goofy, loyal, and a bit like Reese Weatherspoon's character in Legally Blonde. Samantha told Dateline, quote, She was very book smart, but also a little ditzy. In the winter of 2010, Melissa was still bartending at the Sweet Spot and had recently graduated from the Pima Medical Institute, aiming to become a dental hygienist. Now it was at this time that she discovered that she was pregnant, and while the baby was a surprise, she and her boyfriend were excited and committed to becoming new parents. Melissa did share the pregnancy news with a few friends, but she kept the secret from everyone in her family except her sister, Samantha. She wanted to wait until Christmas to tell her mom, but sadly, she would never get that chance. Now, before we continue with the case, let's take a quick break and we'll be right back. That's right, you guys heard me correctly. We have an ad break. I get it's a big deal here at Detective Perspective and I couldn't do it without you guys, so thank you. And I couldn't do it without this week's sponsor, HelloFresh. That's right, HelloFresh. They've been with me a long time now and now they're on Detective Perspective. And with HelloFresh, you get farm fresh pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. So skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. Now, if you don't already know, each HelloFresh box is packed with farm fresh ingredients and everything arrives pre-portioned right to your doorstep with less hassle and obviously less wasted food. That's why I love it. I don't like to go to a grocery store and buy things because as soon as I do, 90% of it goes bad and I end up throwing it in the trash. So having a specific meal that I know what I'm making and having the ingredients laid out right for me allows me to use the food I need and not buy any of the food that I don't. So it's 2024, right? I'm sure a lot of you have decided, hey, listen, I'm going to cut back on the fast food. I want to start making some actual food and sitting down at a dinner table and, and enjoying a good meal that's, that's not only tasty, but also good for you. But as we all know, a lot of us, our schedules are packed. So what do you do? You can turn to HelloFresh's lineup of quick and easy meals, including their 15-minute recipes designed to help you minimize mealtime stress. And trust me, that's why I love them. And listen, not only do I love the convenience, I've said this before, but I love the opportunity. Each HelloFresh meal comes with like an actual card with a picture of what you're going to make, what it's going to look like when you're done. And that's one of the things I love about HelloFresh is, is the, the stress relief, right? It, the meals are planned out for you. It's, it's set it and forget it. You just cook it up, do what the card tells you to do, and you're good to go. But that's the one added benefit that HelloFresh really doesn't emphasize, and, and I'm going to because as a father, I see it. Yes, the food is good. Yes, it's better for you. But I love the fact that it creates memories with me and my kids. We always get the cards that show what our meals are supposed to look like. So we sit around, we cook the meals together, and then we eat together. And a little trick for the parents out there, what I've found is when they're cooking the food with you, they're more incentivized to eat it. Because now they can't sit around and say it doesn't taste good because they have something to lose. They're the ones that cooked it. So just a little trick from, from me to you. It's worked out for me. Maybe it'll, it'll work for you guys as well. So listen, it's obvious. I love HelloFresh. I've been eating their food for a very long time now, and I think you'll like it as well. And if you want to check it out, just go to HelloFresh.com slash Detective Free and use code Detective Free. Detective Free is all one word, by the way, for free breakfast for life. That's one breakfast item per box while your subscription is active. That's free breakfast for life at HelloFresh.com slash Detective Free with my code Detective Free. So go check them out, guys. HelloFresh. America's number one meal kit. And listen, if you want to support Detective Perspective and what I'm doing here, this is how I get sponsors. So if you're thinking about trying the food, make sure you go over there and use my code so they know that I sent you. I'd really appreciate it. It mean a lot to me. Let's get back to the episode. Okay, we're back. So on December 3rd at around 7.30 a.m., Nicole's friend, who I'm going to refer to as Bree, tried calling Nicole, but her phone went to voicemail. Bree thought this was weird because Nicole's phone was always on. Bree then tried calling Melissa, but her phone also went to voicemail as well. 
Brie was concerned, but she decided to wait before heading over to Nicole and Melissa's house to check on them. At the same time, Nicole's mom and Melissa's sister tried calling them too, but their calls also went to voicemail. Now, according to the Deck podcast, which interviewed the lead detective in the case, when Bree still couldn't reach Nicole or Melissa by noon, she decided to drive over to their home. At around 12.20 p.m., Bree arrived and noticed both cars in the driveway. She knocked on the door, but there was no response. She tried the door and found that it was locked, so she went around to the back and peeked through the window. That was when she saw an arm next to the couch and immediately called the police. Now, it's important to note that when first responders arrived, they found that all doors and windows were locked. In order to get inside, they had to break down the front door. After making entry, they found Melissa in the dining room lying face down with her shirt pulled towards her head. Nicole was in the family room nearby, also face down. Both of them had been strangled. Now, according to some stories, Nicole and Melissa had been strangled with a cord or some type of ligature. However, police have never confirmed this to be the case as far as I can tell. Both women did have defensive wounds, but there were no signs of a violent struggle or a fight that had occurred in the house before their deaths. Now, according to some reports, there were also no signs that the house had been ransacked or robbed. And when police arrived and looked around the outside of the house, they found no signs of forced entry, which led them to question if Nicole and Melissa knew their killer or killers. So a lot to unpack here. First off, let's talk about the fact that there were no signs of forced entry, yet when Bree and first responders arrived, all the doors and windows were locked. Well, pretty easy to put together what that, what that means. Whatever the case may be, whether they were invited in or the doors were unlocked, when the offenders entered the apartment, there was a point of entry. Uh, accessible to them. Like I said, whether that was Nicole or Melissa allowing them inside, or maybe Nicole and Melissa inside at the time, and they had their door or windows unlocked, maybe didn't know it, and the suspects were able to gain entry without having to break a window or break a door. Now, the fact that the door was locked when first responders arrived is something that's actually pretty common if you think about it like this. When you have an offender who injures or murders a victim in a home that's not theirs, once they leave, they want to avoid detection of their victim for a relatively decent amount of time. They want to create a separation between them and the victims. It gives them an opportunity to get away and get somewhere else and create a larger window in which the victim, or in this case, victims, could have been killed. Obviously, that's important because the bigger the window the harder it is to pin down who might be involved. So by them locking the door, if someone happens to come by maybe within an hour or two of the killing, they may just assume that the, that the victim's not home and come back later. But in this case, obviously, Bree, an extended period of time had already, already passed. And so she knew something was up because she saw the arm at that point and, and they made entry. But yes, this is a common thing where you'll have an offender lock the door on the way out for this reason, or maybe it just, you could also argue that it was a, a force of habit. Maybe this individual had been there before and locked the door on their way out before. Not as likely, but also I guess that's possible as well. Then you have the fact that both the victims, both Nicole and Melissa, were face down and relatively close to each other. Now, let's first talk about the cord or the ligature. The police aren't going to tell you if this is true or not, in my opinion, because even though it's a cold case, it's a form of guilt knowledge, right? And we've talked about this before. If, if someone comes forward with information and police are looking for a way of determining whether it's credible or not, let's say hypothetically they were strangled with an extension cord. If they were talking to someone who said they had knowledge of what had happened or they were the one that actually killed them, they might ask them how you did it. And if this person says, I, I strangled them with an extension cord and that information is not public knowledge, well, it's pretty, pretty compelling information and pretty credible at that point if they're able to tell you that. But if you put that out to the public, now you, you can't use it. You can't use it. So there's really no advantage for something like that type of detail to be put out there other than to determine credibility of a suspect or a witness down the road. So I don't know if we'll ever know. And for the sake of what we're doing here today... It's not necessarily that important. We know they were both they were both strangled. So let's talk about that because for me, strangulation, right? It's a it's something where the offender has to really put all their focus on one victim at a time 
And from the information we have, it doesn't appear that either victim was restrained in some way where you could have a scenario where one victim was killed while the other one was tied up. It seems like they were both free to move unless the offender had removed any restraints before they left the area. But let's assume for this conversation they didn't. What could that mean? To me, it suggests that there was some other form of control, some other form of threat that they were using, and it could have been a knife or a gun. Now, maybe the offender had that weapon but didn't choose to use it. He wanted to be more personal. Or you could have a situation where there's two killers. For me, I don't necessarily believe that there was. I believe there was probably one killer. They were both killed in a very similar manner. They were both face down, which... I'm still a little, the jury's still out on that one for me. I guess you could have a situation where they could have strangled them from behind. Maybe that was their MO. Or you could have a situation where after strangling them, he flipped them over and that's just the way he wanted to leave them. Maybe he didn't want to look at them. I, I don't know. But it also could be as simple as he just strangled them from behind. But to me, if you, if you, if you made me put out my theory on this one, I, I do think it's more than likely one person. And... I'm going to wait till the end to get into potential suspects, what, what type of person we might be looking for in this case. Because as you learn more about the victims, you'll see that there's a few different potential suspect pools that we could be pulling from here. Now, the Phoenix Police Department did process Nicole and Melissa's home for evidence. According to Dateline, they gathered various items like cell phones, clothes, and fingerprints. And when Nicole and Melissa's bodies were sent for an autopsy, sexual assault kits were also performed as well. The police interviewed Nicole's friend, Bree, and asked her to share what she knew about Nicole and Melissa. Bree did state that while she wasn't close with Melissa, she did know one important thing. Melissa was pregnant. This fact immediately made the case a triple homicide under Arizona law. Bree then told the police that she had spoken to Nicole the night before. At that time, Nicole mentioned she was waiting for a ride to a bartending job at a private party, but she didn't say where the party was or who was giving her a ride. The last time Nicole texted was around 11.15 p.m. She said no one had picked her up for the job. All of this information led police to theorize that Nicole and Melissa were killed between 11.15 p.m. on December 2nd, when Nicole last texted, and 12.20 p.m. on December 3rd, when Bree went to the house. Now, the police also spoke to Melissa and Nicole's neighbors as well, and none of them mentioned seeing or hearing anything strange on the night in question. Now, according to what neighbors later shared with the media, Nicole and Melissa mostly kept to themselves, but they often had a bunch of cars come and go from the house. Some of the neighbors even noticed people with expensive cars at the home. Now, this was kind of what I was alluding to a few minutes ago as far as multiple suspect pools, right? Um, you could deduce whatever you want from this little statement here as far as what this means. But at minimum, what it tells us is that there were multiple individuals who knew where Nicole and Melissa lived. Now, some of them may have been close friends, but there's also a possibility that there were individuals who Melissa and Nicole weren't really that familiar with. They could have been individuals who were just coming along for the ride with someone else. I don't know if there was some type of business transactions going on there. We can, again, we'll talk a little bit later in the perspective, but there's a, there's a few different reasons why vehicles could have been coming, going from that home. But at minimum, like I said, it does create a level of exposure because now these individuals know that Nicole and Melissa are living in this house and they're living there alone. Now, while police were still at the scene processing the house and conducting interviews, Melissa's boyfriend, who I'm going to call Michael, showed up at the house and was immediately questioned. According to the Deck podcast, Michael explained that he had been at the house with Nicole and Melissa the evening before. As they were hanging out, Nicole received a call about a bartending job for a private party. The caller said he wanted Melissa to come too, and he would send a limo to pick them up and promise that they would make tons of money. Nicole persuaded Melissa to go with her, and Michael left around 8 p.m. He went out to a few clubs that night, but he never spoke to Melissa again. Now, according to Michael, Melissa did try to call him around 10.30 p.m., but he missed it, and when he tried to call her back after midnight, her phone went to voicemail. He kept trying, but the call still went unanswered, and after 2 a.m., he left the club and went home. After not hearing from Melissa the next day, he finally went to the house, and that's when he encountered the police. When he was questioned about any potential enemies Melissa or Nicole might have had, Michael stated that Melissa didn't have any. 
Now, if he had to guess, he suspected the murders might be connected to Nicole because according to him, she had some questionable friends. Now, it's important to note that before leaving, Michael agreed to give the police his DNA, which they collected on the spot right there, and he later took a polygraph as well, and police would eventually come out and say that Michael was not a suspect. Now, to dive in a little bit more to Michael and his potential involvement with this crime, the DNA, even though they took it on the spot, you would expect to find his DNA all over that residence. So it would be very difficult to use that as a piece of incriminating evidence to link him to these murders. Uh, as far as the polygraph, obviously that's important. I don't know if he pa passed it or not. I'm assuming if police are coming out publicly and saying that he's not a suspect, more than likely he passed it. But more importantly, what I didn't mention in this last little segment here is what was said earlier, and that's Michael's alleged whereabouts on the night in question. That's more important than even the polygraph and the DNA. It doesn't take a detective to know that an individual physically can't be in two places at once. So he had said he went out to a couple clubs. And if that's true, more than likely these clubs had other witnesses at those clubs and, and more importantly, surveillance cameras. So it's highly likely that police went out, checked to see where Michael had said that he was hanging out and were able to see him on camera. That would be the best evidence or even have employees of those establishments confirm that Michael was at their location until approximately 2 a.m. Now, the one thing I will say is they're basing the timeline off the fact that the girls no longer picked up their phones after 1130. And to be completely transparent, I think that's the right move. The fact that they were going to voicemail and that was an uncommon occurrence for both of them. I agree. That's more likely the time. But if I want to play devil's advocate just for the sake of giving alternate theories, if they hadn't been killed around 1130, then you could have a situation where Michael went to the residence after 2 a.m. to check on them at that point or to sleep over there. That's possible. But I think with everything we have in totality, more than likely police were able to rule Michael out definitively. And that's why they were confident in coming out publicly and saying he wasn't a suspect. Now, the police continued interviewing people who were close to Nicole and Melissa. Nobody could think of anyone who would want to hurt them. Everyone said the women were kind and caring, always willing to help others, and their house was a constant hangout spot for friends. Police also talked to Melissa's ex-fiance after her family suggested to look into him. He claimed he had nothing to do with the murders and was willing to give a DNA sample, which he did. Now, according to Melissa's mom, this lead didn't go anywhere. The Arizona Republic reported that as the investigation continued, Nicole's family and friends distributed flyers at nearby grocery stores and asked around the neighborhood for any information. Now, unfortunately, they didn't learn anything useful that could help them in the case. Meanwhile, Melissa's family cleaned out her home and found a Christmas gift she had planned to give to her mom. It was a positive pregnancy test in a Ziploc bag with the words Merry Xmas written on the outside of the bag in black marker. On December 13th, the Phoenix Police Department held a press conference where they updated the public on where the case stood at that time. The police said they had checked all parts of the women's lives, trying to find any suspects, but came up with none. What's interesting is they wouldn't say if anything was taken from the house, only that they couldn't rule out robbery or any other motives. And as I mentioned earlier, they did say that Melissa's boyfriend had been very helpful and wasn't a suspect. Now, according to the Arizona Republic, both Nicole and Melissa's families were also at the press conference. They pleaded with the people to share any information they had. Melissa's mom, Sandra, said through tears, quote, Not only did they take Melissa's life, but they also took my unborn grandbaby, and that would have been my first grandbaby. Sandra held up Melissa's pregnancy test in the Ziploc bag and said, quote, Now all we have is memories, and our lives will never be the same. Nicole's mother, Rachel, said she was devastated that she would never be able to put her arms around her daughter again and tell her how much she loved her. Police kept looking into the triple homicide, but they weren't getting anywhere. The physical evidence didn't match anyone, and no suspects were emerging. Nicole and Melissa's families kept talking to the media, hoping to bring attention to the unsolved murders. By the one-year mark, there was still no progress in the case. 
Nicole and Melissa's moms organized the first of many vigils to remember their daughters. They urged the public to come forward with any information that could help in the investigation, but unfortunately their pleas did not bring in any solid tips. By 2013, the police had exhausted all viable leads, so they reached out to Silent Witness, a nonprofit group that works with law enforcement to solve crimes by gathering anonymous tips from the public. Through Silent Witness, a reward of $1,000 was offered. The families raised an additional $8,000, bringing the total reward to $9,000. Silent Witness also placed billboards around town with details about the double homicide and the reward, hoping it would bring in helpful information. Unfortunately, it did not. In December of 2015, five years had gone by and police still didn't have any answers. Now, understandably, Nicole's mom, Rachel, was very frustrated not knowing what happened. She told the Arizona Republic that she had considered various scenarios and wasn't able to rule out any of them. Now, in early 2016, something really interesting happened in this case. Rachel got info from what she believes was a reliable source, saying Nicole had been a confidential informant for the Phoenix police before she was killed. Rachel told the Republic Tuesday that the source didn't know what exactly Nicole did as a CI or how she got to be a CI in the first place, but Rachel thought it might be linked to Nicole getting arrested in a wiretapping investigation. This investigation resulted in dozens of arrests ranging from drug offenses to weapons charges to financial crimes. Now from what we understand and what we have gathered, Nicole got looped into this investigation after she called a friend to buy marijuana. However. She was charged with various crimes like money laundering, dealing with a gang, marijuana offenses, and using electronic communication for a drug deal. Now, ultimately, Nicole ended up taking a deal where she pleaded guilty to the electronic communication charge and the rest of the charges were dropped and she was put on probation. But before Nicole passed away, she had hired a lawyer to appeal her case. Obviously, it never got there. So obviously, with all this being said, when Rachel found out that Nicole was possibly a CI, she wondered if that's why Nicole and Melissa got killed in the first place. So there's there's a lot, again, to talk about here. Unfortunately, I worked in narcotics for many years, and I've had situations where someone we had arrested, they had a variety of charges, and we would work out a deal where they would we would drop certain charges in exchange for their cooperation in other cases, AKA a, a, a confidential informant. So it's not completely off the table here. And there's more to this story, which we're gonna get into in a second, but let's just unpack this part of it. First off, it's possible there's more to this story that we just don't know about. It's possible it wasn't just a marijuana transaction. During this wiretap, there may have been other phone exchanges where Nicole was going back and forth with targets of the investigation where during those conversations, she gave indications that she knew what this individual was doing and she may have even been facilitating certain things. Listen, it's not too far of a stretch here to say that in many cases, strip clubs are directly connected to narcotics. It's just they go hand in hand. Um, they're, they're sold uh, inside those establishments all the time. And they're also brought in and out of those establishments all the time. It's very common knowledge. So could Nicole have gotten tied up with something like that or at minimum uh, been associating with individuals who were, who were tied up in that? It's absolutely possible. So whatever the case may be, she somehow got brought into all of this. Could it be a situation where, and I think I've said this on this channel before, if not on here, I've said it on Crime Feed. I remember saying it. Police, we will sometimes look at an overall investigation and we look for the individual who has the, the least amount of involvement, but a lot to lose. And it's pretty self-explanatory, but that's a situation where you have someone who's on the outskirts of things, but may know a lot of information and could potentially be charged with some serious crimes because of their connection to the, the crime itself, right? They don't have to be the main offender to be convicted of conspiracy, right? That's just the way it works. So when you present that to these individuals, they will sometimes uh, work in exchange for a deal. Could that have been the case here? It's possible. But when it relates to a double homicide, unless she was directly tied 
to being a confidential informant or a, a confidential witness for that matter, someone who's going to testify at court. I don't I don't know if this these types of crimes would justify a murder. I, I just it's possible anything's on the table. But to me, on the surface, it seems like something else could be at play here. But again, when you have something like this that comes forward, you definitely don't want to just discredit it. It's it's a, a plausible scenario. And if I were the parents of Nicole, I would want to know for certain what their involvement was with the Phoenix Police Department. And obviously, Rachel wanted to know as well. And she took it as far as she could to get those answers. So to start, Rachel went directly to the source. She went to the Phoenix Police Department and asked them directly uh, if Nicole was a CI, but according to her, she didn't get a direct answer. So at that point, Rachel and Nicole's dad filed a wrongful death lawsuit against the city of Phoenix. They claimed that Nicole was a confidential informant and that the police didn't explain the risks associated with being a CI. They also didn't keep her safe. And it's possible that her involvement as a CI was the reason she was killed. And at the core of it, the purpose of the lawsuit was to figure out definitively if Nicole was in fact a CI for the Phoenix Police Department. And as expected, immediately after the lawsuit was filed, the Phoenix Police Department released a public statement. And in that statement, they said, quote, the Phoenix Police Department has been aggressively investigating this homicide since it occurred in 2010. Although the case remains open to date, investigators have not found any evidence to support this recent claim. The Phoenix Police Department will remain focused on the facts surrounding the case, and we are committing to solving this crime. The lawsuit moved forward in the court system, and multiple people from the police department testified under oath that Nicole was not a CI. Following these testimonies, Rachel agreed to drop the lawsuit, but she continued to fight to bring awareness to Nicole and Rachel's murders. In December of 2019, Rachel held an annual vigil to remind the public that Nicole and Melissa's murders were still unsolved. Rachel said she was frustrated that there were no leads in the case, but she wouldn't stop until the killer was found. She said, quote, I just want justice. I think it's possible to find. We just need that one missing piece. It's not over. It will never be over, especially not for me. As of December 2021, it had been 11 years since Nicole and Melissa were murdered. The Phoenix Police Department shared with the Arizona Republic that solving these murders had been a challenge for investigators. They tested evidence and followed up on every lead and still weren't able to solve the case. They were waiting for new technology or someone to step forward with new information. Now fast forward to December 2023. We now just marked the 13th year since the triple homicide. The police labeled this case as cold and Rachel mentioned that the police informed her they were shelving the case due to the lack of progress. In response, her family launched a GoFundMe to increase the reward money, aiming for $100,000. That same month, Dateline released an article about Nicole and Melissa's murders. The police gave an additional update in the case, stating, quote, Investigators questioned all the victim's acquaintances and any suspects found during the investigation. There were several investigative leads, but no evidence to date supporting moving forward with prosecution. The police went on to say that without additional evidence or a confession, the case would be very difficult to prosecute. Now to pause real quick, I always say we have to look between the lines and figure out what the police are not saying. Uh, to me, what they're putting out there is pretty much the truth. I feel like they're at a standstill. In fact, this type of honesty and transparency is pretty rare where you have a police department, especially a large police department like Phoenix, just come out and say, hey, listen, we've exhausted all possible leads, all possible evidence. We got nothing. And, and we, we don't know what else to do with it. We could keep it on our desk and tell, it, tell everyone it's actively being worked, but that would be a lie. There does come a point where if every lead has been explored, you have to devote your resources, your personnel, to other unsolved cases. Now, the only pushback I'll give here, which is why we're covering this case, this was part of the main reason I decided, hey, we're going to cover this. Yeah, for the Phoenix Police Department, in their opinion, from their perspective, genuinely, they may believe that all avenues have been explored. That could be the, the, their truth. However, if you were to allow an outside party, a private investigator or another detective or, or someone else who has an investigative background 
to look at this case from square one, to look at all the evidence, maybe they would see something different than what previous detectives have seen. We've seen it before. I've seen it on numerous cases where something is looked at by police officers in a department over a 20 year period and they all come to the same conclusion. And then you get this young detective with a fresh perspective who's not necessarily better than anyone, but just sees something in a different way and from a different angle and says, well, what about this? And you look around the room and all the older detectives that have already worked this are looking at each other, waiting for someone to say, yeah, we've already looked into that. And yet nobody does. And sometimes that works out and it leads somewhere. And sometimes it doesn't. But as I always say, you really got nothing to lose. And yes, you can say that it's been exhausted and, and, and everything's been explored. I don't like the phrase it's being shelved. If that's what exactly was said, I feel like at this point, if they feel that they've exhausted all resources, then they either A, have to put more information out to the public and allow them to work it or bring independent investigators in and allow them to take a look at the evidence and see what they can find. Now, along that line of getting some different opinions, some different perspectives on the case, Dateline asked Nicole and Melissa's families about their theories on what had happened. And Melissa's sister, Samantha, shared that she did have some theories but she still didn't know why or who would want to harm her sister or Nicole. And she thinks Melissa might have been at the wrong place at the wrong time. Samantha did mention that she doesn't think Melissa's boyfriend was involved at all. And over the years since her sister's death, he stayed in touch with the family, reaching out occasionally, always being respectful. Now, as far as Rachel's concerned, she told Dateline she doesn't know who would want to kill Nicole or Melissa. She still wishes for justice, though she's not certain it will ever happen. She won't ever give up, though. She said, quote, I have to keep moving forward and doing anything and everything I can to bring attention to this case. And that's where we're going to end this week's episode, and we're going to dive into the perspective. But before we do, Rachel, I want you to know we're here with you. You're not doing this alone. We're going to bring attention to this case as well. All right, so now from my perspective on this investigation, on this case. And I went off a couple different times here as far as what can still be done from here. So I won't I won't be redundant and repeat that. Just to summarize real quick, police have said they're shelving it. There's nothing more they can do. I have already laid out some possible scenarios where you could bring outside investigators in to look at the evidence, um, whether that's local, state, or federal. If they If it hasn't been done already, And maybe it has. I don't want to judge. But if it hasn't, that is one angle you can go. But to go back to the facts of this case, um, to just kind of recap, no signs of forced entry. From what we know, no signs of a robbery. Uh, When first responders arrived, all doors and windows were locked, suggesting that whoever killed these two young women uh, locked up on their way out, which I think was deliberate, which I think was to create distance between the murder and when someone would eventually find them. As far as the placement of the two women, as far as the placement of Melissa and Nicole, um, to me, it could mean you have two two killers. I think it's more likely that it's one. I think more than likely this individual used some form of force or coercion to control the women, to to have them conform or, or respond to whatever they demanded of them. Hey, listen, you stand over here, you stand over here. Nothing will happen to you. They probably had a gun or a knife, something more than likely probably a gun where even though the person was, you know, involved with one of the two victims, the other one didn't feel that they could leave. You could also be looking at a scenario where, and as sad as this is, whoever was first, Melissa or Nicole didn't want to leave the other behind, which is really sad to think about. Um, But there is the scenario where there's two attackers. Two individuals go in there and they decide to kill the women in a similar manner, even though it was two different offenders. It's also possible. I will say that they had allegedly defensive wounds, which to me I would hope would suggest maybe some type of skin cells or or something under the fingernails that could be tested. Although if that were the case, I feel like we would know by now that there's DNA that they're trying to connect to someone. That could be true. 
You know, they did take the DNA from the ex-fiance and from Michael. As far as we know, there could be others. And if they're grabbing DNA from potential suspects, that could indicate that maybe they have some unidentified DNA for, as for, you know, for evidence. But at that point, it would be entered into CODIS. There'd be some other things going on. So could be a lot of variables at play there. But to get to what I was originally talking about at the beginning of this episode, I said multiple suspect pools. Let's talk about that for a second, because that's really where we're at here. And I've, I've already said a little bit about it. But first off, the establishment they were working in. This isn't to condemn them. This isn't to villainize them. There's nothing wrong with working at a strip club. We're just calling it for what it is. There's some suspicious characters that frequent strip clubs. Not all of them. They can all, I've been to strip clubs. There's nothing wrong with them. But I can tell you from personal experience going in there, both on my own time and as a police officer working undercover, you there's a lot of criminal activity that happens in those establishments. And so is it possible individuals from the strip club had seen Nicole or Melissa or both and were attracted to them, wanted something from them, and maybe followed them home one night without their knowing? Absolutely possible. That's one scenario, which would make it very difficult for police, right? If these individuals uh, never had contact directly with Melissa or Nicole, how does the law enforcement agency go back and get a record of every single patron or customer that's been in the strip club? It's about privacy when you go there. So they wouldn't even have that record. How far would you go back? So it could be any individual who frequented that bar or even came in once or twice who is a potential suspect. That creates a large suspect pool. Then you could have a situation in line with what the neighbors have said where maybe Melissa and Nicole were hanging out with some individuals from the club after hours or on different nights, and some of those individuals came over to the house on different occasions and hung out, maybe just as friends, maybe just platonically. Maybe they were smoking marijuana. Maybe they were doing other stuff. Who knows? Those individuals that were directly involved with Melissa and Nicole were probably identified and probably spoken with. Not a problem. The bigger pool becomes all the individuals that they were with, right? Are they being transparent with law enforcement? Are they giving a log of every single individual, even if it was just up to the residents for a short period of time um, that they came to that house with? Do they have a running list of every single individual who has frequented Nicole and Melissa's house, even if it was just as an acquaintance, even if they didn't directly communicate with Melissa or Nicole? I highly doubt it. So again, expansive suspect pool. We're talking about two different groups, just two different groups so far, a lot of people involved. Let me throw another scenario at you. We've seen a lot of cases lately too that I've been researching and looking into where there are these unsolved cases and you're thinking it's a loved one or a friend or an ex or whatever it might be and come to find out it's a neighbor. It's just a neighbor who's familiar with the house, knows that these two women are living alone, can see when people are coming and going from the residence and has a fascination with one or both of these women and one night decides to go all the way with it, decides to go over there, take advantage of these women and kill them, right? We've seen numerous situations now where there's no direct connection. The neighbor never had any, you know, extensive uh, interactions with the victims and yet just knew them as, you know, neighbors but for some reason took it a step forward and went through with something horrific. That is possible as well. So now we're talking about the surrounding community that could also be aware that these two young women are living alone and on one particular night took advantage of it. The only final thing I'll say about suspects is it could still be a family member or a friend, but I'd like to think that most of those individuals were vetted thoroughly because when they are, if someone is tied to it, whether it's through a contradicting statement about their whereabouts or a contradicting statement compared to the, the digital data from cell phones, et cetera, they're usually identified pretty quickly where they find the person who's not telling the truth and they're able to bring them in and pin them down and, and kind of connect the dots. So once they get past that immediate pool and it gets to the more expansive pools that I just described, 
that's when it becomes a needle in a haystack. That's when you need someone to come forward. And in that type of community, that type of surrounding, that type of environment, let's just say that those individuals aren't known to cooperate with police often unless you have something over their head, which brings me to my final thought on possible suspects. Nicole, from what we know from the lawsuit, she was not a CI. But it does seem like she was connected to certain individuals that were in that space. Just because she wasn't a CI doesn't mean that people didn't think she was. Again, this is coming from Rachel who said she had a reliable source. Well, this reliable source thought she was a CI. And by the way, maybe she was or maybe she was talking to police. Maybe there just wasn't something on paper and... You have to acknowledge that law enforcement may not be telling the truth as far as their involvement with that. But let's just say for the sake of this conversation, they are. They were under oath. Let's take them at their word. It could be a situation where the individuals in that space, in that world, thought she was working with police. And depending on what she knew, if she knew anything at all, we, we don't know. What type of individuals were coming over in these expensive cars? Could one of them have been involved in some heavy stuff where they got an indication that Nicole was potentially working with police? If what she knew was significant, could it lead to a murder? Of course. But again, it doesn't sound like Nicole was that deep into these things. And so that wouldn't be my prime area that I explored. I think we're more than likely looking at someone who could have frequented one of the bars, one of the strip clubs, or may have been an acquaintance of someone who was friends with Nicole or Melissa or both. So where does that leave us now? Well, what I just said earlier. Yes, Phoenix Police Department, as far as they're concerned, there's nothing else that they can do with this case. We need to bring outside parties, and if we haven't done already, uh, someone who can look at this case with a fresh set of eyes, start from ground zero, and reinvestigate the, the case from the beginning. Let them look at all the evidence. Let them look at all the witness statements. Let them look at all the digital data. Let them look at everything you had. And by the way, don't just bring in one person. Bring in a group of people. Allow them all to look at it. Really get different perspectives, different backgrounds on this and see what they come up with. Maybe there's something in there that they see that the initial investigators didn't. Maybe there's one or two more angles to explore. And maybe those one or two angles are the reason why this case hasn't been solved yet. Maybe that's the path we need to go on. And I wouldn't even say get all detectives in there or or investigators. Get some people from different backgrounds. Because if you have people who all have the similar mindset, they're probably going to come to a similar conclusion. Get some people who may think outside the box, who may look at this and take a different approach. At this point, what do you really have to lose? And finally, I want to end by saying my thoughts are with Nicole and Melissa's family. This is obviously a very difficult situation, especially considering not only did you lose these two young women, you also lost an unborn child. Uh, Their life didn't even get to start. So it's an extremely difficult situation. Although it's been 13 years, I would just say don't lose hope. And I want to end with what Rachel said in her last quote there, which is that she wants to continue to bring attention to this case. And I want you to know that I'm with you. And that's why I'm doing my part by bringing attention to this case as well. And I want all of you out there, if you know anything, obviously, do the right thing. Step up, call the Phoenix Police Department, make them aware of what you know, and maybe it'll lead somewhere. And with that being said, I just want to recap the case. Nicole Glass and Melissa Mason were found dead on December 3rd, 2010, in their home in the 4200 block of East Cambridge Avenue in Phoenix, Arizona, They were both strangled to death at some point between 11.15 p.m. on December 2nd and 12 p.m. on December 3rd. If you have any information regarding this case, you can contact Silent Witness at 480-948-6377 or you can leave an anonymous tip on the Silent Witness website at silentwitness.org. And just remember, a reward is still available And if you're okay with calling, like I just said a few minutes ago, you can always call the Phoenix Police Department as well. All right, so continuing on this whole premise of trying to bring closure, trying to solve these cases, 
Uh, you guys know I'm very passionate about giving back to the to the cases that we cover. We do it with Criminal Coffee Company. But I want to talk about another organization that some of you may be familiar with, and that's Seasons of Justice. Now, some of you may have heard of Seasons of Justice before. It was started by Ashley Flowers. So if you're listening to True Crime uh, with me, more than likely you know who she is. She's the host of Crime Junkie as well as one of the owners of Audio Chuck, or maybe the sole owner of Audio Chuck. She's big in the true crime space. Most people know her. Um, she started this organization back, I believe, in 2020. I also know a good friend and colleague of mine, uh, Voices uh, for Justice, Sarah Turney, I believe. She's on the board as well. For those of you that don't know, Seasons of Justice is a nonprofit organization dedicated to helping families um, that are that are involved with cold cases by bridging the gap between law enforcement and the cutting edge forensic technology available that may assist in solving those cases. So they raise money to kind of do what we do, raise, you know, raise the funds to provide the necessary, uh, whether it's DNA testing or some type of forensic analysis that may push a case forward and may ultimately get it solved. And they've actually had a lot of success doing this since they started. So just to give you some of the hard numbers. So since 2020, Seasons of Justice has raised more than $1 million in grants for more than 140 cases in North America, which has led to the solving of six cold cases. That's incredible. That's six more that, that wouldn't have been solved if they weren't involved. So whether it's one, two, 20, doesn't matter. This organization is helping to give answers to the families that deserve it. And whenever you have an organization that's dedicated to doing that, I'm in, which is why Detective Perspective is getting involved for the month of January, and I'd like your help as well. So my goal until January 30th is to raise $1,000 for this organization. That's all I want to raise, $1,000 if we get more. That's great. And if you want to help out, I'll have the link in the description as well. Um, but if you want to help out, I'll put it on the screen here. We'll have it all over the place. We'll have it on social as well. It's going to be HTTPS colon slash slash give butter dot com slash SOJ underscore detective perspective. I know that's a lot. So again, I'll have it on the screen. I'll have it in the description, both on audio and on video. We're also going to do a social media post for Seasons of Justice as well. And I'd really like to get this, guys. Like I said, we have Criminal Coffee, which is raising money every day. I'm covering these cases to give it, you know, more exposure, more attention to them. We're trying to solve the cases that way. And we're all in this together. I don't work directly with Seasons of Justice, but I stand behind what they're doing. And I hope you do as well. And if you want to help me get to that goal, just go over to that website, click on it. Whatever you can donate, whether it's a dollar, two dollar, five dollars, whatever you can do, go over there, donate, and and leave a comment in the description box below. If you're on YouTube, leave a comment down there. Let me know if you donated. I'd really appreciate it. But that's gonna do it for me, guys. We're back, 2024. We're here. If you made it to the end, I really, really appreciate it. I hope everyone had a great holiday, and I hope you're off to a good new year. Uh, I'll be back next week. Stay safe out there. I'll see you soon. <laughs>